Thank you. And again, this is our client enrichment series presentation on RWA fundamentals. If you wish not to continue in the session because it is being recorded, we completely understand. We are recording the session so we can post it online to our video library for any time viewing by our PBS customers. You can find archived recordings of more than 40 previous client enrichment series training sessions on topics ranging from RWAs to leasing to space utilization and more on our YouTube channel. The link is in the chat and at the end of the slide deck. My name is Rebecca Hood and I'm a customer strategist based out of Chicago's Great Lakes region for GSA. But more importantly, I am your host for today's edition of the client enrichment series. Today we have two of our best subject matter experts presenting for you. Ashley Carlson, our National RWA Program Manager, and Rachel Bixell, RWA Program Analyst, both from our GSA headquarters in Washington, DC. You can see them on your screen, and I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce them. Ashley Carlson is our National Program Manager for Reimbursable, Reimbursable Services. Ashley works with many of our PBS business lines to address questions and concerns from both internal and external customers. Her team is responsible for providing training and education resources to our customers, as well as creating, maintaining, updating, and operationalizing the RWA policies that govern the program. Additionally, the Reimbursable Services Program manages the RITA and eRITA software applications that house RWA data and documentation. Ashley has worked for GSA for over 19 years, beginning her career as a financial management specialist in one of the premier intern programs we have at GSA. Ashley lives in Leesburg, Virginia with her husband and two daughters and works at the GSA headquarters in Washington, DC. Ashley received her BS degree from Virginia Tech and her MBA from George Washington University. And Ashley is also a graduate of the Excellence in Government Fellows Leadership Program. And Rachel Bixell. Rachel, we are excited to permanently welcome to the National RWA Program Office. Rachel will support the National Reimbursable Services Program, specifically the RITA system and the overarching RWA process. Rachel joined GSA back in 2007 as a capital construction project manager in the Great Lakes region. In 2015, Rachel transitioned to the region's project management programs branch, serving as the regional RWA manager, schedule advocate, global project management subject matter expert, and the editor in chief of the region's critical path newsletter. Rachel is from Madison, Wisconsin, where her family owns and operates a small residential construction company. Prior to joining GSA, Rachel assisted with housing design and construction and worked for seven years as a supervisor at Panera Bread. Rachel holds a BA degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in International Studies. She currently resides in Chicago, loves to travel, and has taken up furniture making over the pandemic. Before I turn the presentation over to Ashley and Rachel, let's take care of a couple housekeeping instructions. Closed captioning is available for this event. Select the in-window Zoom captioning by clicking on your More button on your Zoom panel. The More button is down at the bottom, and then select View Subtitles. Also, we have automatically muted your audio to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. As you can tell, we are using the Zoom for Government platform today. This platform allows you to customize your viewing experience by maximizing or minimizing the presentation area as well as the various pods. Speaking of pods, you will see that there is a chat pod as well as a Q&A area. For this session, please use the chat pod for any administrative questions you have or to report any issues you're experiencing and one of our CES team members can assist you. To answer any questions you have today, we also have some RWA support behind the scenes. Please use the Q&A pod to ask your RWA and presentation related questions. Any questions that we are unable to get to today will be noted and all of the questions will be answered and posted on our website, which is www.gsa.gov forward slash CES. 
And now I'd like to turn the session over to our pr first presenter, Ashley Carlson. Ashley, take it away. So Rebecca, I think we're gonna start out with some quiz questions before we jump right in. So okay. we'll have our first poll question. Thank you. Okay, here we go. All right, so as Rebecca pulls that in, everybody should see the question pop up. For those of you who are having issues or are not able to see it, we have the question there on the slide and you're welcome to provide your information and your response in the um, chat pane for us. But the poll is, which of the following roles or roles best describes your involvement with the RWA process? Select whichever one is appropriate for you. Give everybody a few minutes to vote. Rebecca, I think you can see the results and I cannot since I'm sharing with everybody. So I'll yep. look to you to. Okay. <laughs> yep. I'm just giving, there we go. looks like, okay, we've got 144 people who have participated. Just wanted to let everybody who wanted to, to vote. And there's quite a variety of folks here. Looks like most are project managers, followed by building property and portfolio managers, contracting officers. Oops. I just lost the poll. There we go. Um, and funds or budget financial management, followed by fund certifying official. Great. All right. So we just wanted to know a little bit about who you guys are now that you know who we are. So our next one, and as Rebecca pulls it in, what access do you currently have in eReta? Data entry user, read only user, or oh, I don't have access. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We'll share here shortly. Give you a few minutes to vote. Still lots of people voting. I'll give another couple moments here. And thank you for those of you who are sharing in the chat what your roles are. All right. I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results. Almost a dead heat between data entry user and folks who do not have access with some read only users thrown in for good measure. All right. Well, that helps us know and understand who we've got with us and perhaps what you've done or not done within our system. So. Don't worry if you don't know what some of those acronyms mean, I promise Rachel and I will get into that here shortly. So our agenda for the day, just to set up how the next hour and 45 minutes will go, we are going to walk through RWA basics. So the name of the course obviously has RWA in it. We're gonna get really what is an RWA? Then we'd like to walk into some of the appropriations law, the things that govern the program and some of the different reasons we do things and then some more internal things that we'd like to share with you, our policy, which is GSA's interpretation of how we implement some of the fiscal laws and then other things that we do from our perspective. Then we're gonna jump in pretty heavy and talk about the project and RWA process, which based on having so many project managers on, that should be great education for you folks unfamiliar or a good recap for folks who have used it, but walking through all of the parts because the project and the RWA do work hand in hand We'll talk about eReta, which we just mentioned in terms of who has access, help you identify how to get access if you don't have it or ensure you have the correct access. We'll talk about work requests, go through some of our requirements development. So what things we need from your project managers that our project managers may need, estimates and their importance and how they tie into the entire RWA process. Then we're gonna walk through some of the RWA acceptance requirements, many of which are the previous bullets on here, so we'll tie into that. Well, what happens if we need more money on a project? That would call for an RWA amendment. We'll walk about that, and then RWA closeout. We'll finish us out on the whole process, so you'll see start to finish, how you get in the system, and then how we close out the projects at the end. Then we're going to give you some more resources and information. So as we go through, if you have questions, as we've set up front, you're welcome to use the Q&A pod and our team of experts will be here to help answer some of your questions. And you can always email us or email the contacts we have at the end of the presentation with additional questions. So with that, we're gonna keep going. 
So the first thing we mentioned was RWA basics. So what is an RWA? RWA stands for reimbursable work authorization. Sounds complicated, it's actually rather simple. It just bounds the agreement between GSA and the customer where we're actually saying, what is your expectation that you want? What would you like us to provide? It's essentially your order. And we're saying, sure, we can do that. Here's the cost and we document the agreement. That's the basic terms to put behind it. There's obviously a lot more to it, hence the need for an almost two hour training to understand it, right? But the important thing to understand is that it truly does make that binding agreement between us where you guys outline things, can't just do things willy nilly. We need to have a lot of things behind it as we'll get into. Another important thing to bring up when we talk about the RWA basics is the RWA form. It's the RWA form 2957. For those of you who have been working in the RWA arena, if you will, for several years or are brand new, hopefully you're familiar with it. It's generated and submitted within our e-reader application. So it's not something that you'd be downloading, looking on a forms library or Googling and trying to find. It's actually completed inside our application and then we can have it printed out for you and you can reference it in our documentation. But an important thing behind it, we commonly get questions from folks is, wow, what is this form? The form, it's an interagency agreement. It's actually an interagency agreement that we worked with OMB to establish and make sure it covers all the requirements and it can be formally used as that. So there's no need for additional interagency agreements beyond that, which I think is a great thing. It sets up the needs we have and covers us from that fiscal financial perspective as well. So that's kind of what an RWA is. The graphic in the middle makes it very simple to see the process of where we're going with the money. Because again, the RWA is an agreement, but it's actually an agreement of materials, services, projects, whatever things you may need and the money behind it. So as you see, you guys as the customer start with the money, you give us an RWA, then GSA is holding on to the money, if you will, then we contractually obligate it and award the money to a contractor to pay them. So it flows all the way through, pretty cool, like different banks, right? Okay. So an important thing we mentioned kind of at the onset was appropriations law. Appropriations law are something that every federal agency obviously has to be familiar with and pay attention to and make sure they're obviously abiding by. There are certain things that govern our authority to do our work. There are the appropriations that GSA utilizes to actually deliver work for you, whether it be um, renovations in your space, um, studies you need us to do, whatever it might be. These are the different authorities that we have to do it. Not gonna read through each one. That's something I should probably say at the onset for everybody between Rachel and myself. There's a lot of information on the slides which have been shared. If you don't have them, you can let the client enrichment team know and they can share them with you. But we're gonna to try to have this be more conversational so you can learn um, more from us than just from reading on the slides. So the three appropriations that actually impact and give us the authority to do the work that we do are the Property Act, the Constructions and Buildings, and the Economy Act. We have exactly where you can find them. If you wanna go and look them up in the red book, you can. They're all under 40 US code. Actually, the first two are, Economy Act is in a different part of it. But what do they mean? So one of the reasons folks come to GSA is because of our use of the Property Act. It means we can do work in our buildings. So in buildings in GSA's custody control our jurisdiction for our tenants. And it's really cool, it gives us a lot of a lot of flexibility in terms of you guys meet your obligational requirements and then GSA has a reasonable amount of time from there to actually accomplish the required work. The construction of buildings follows a very similar outline. The only difference is that um, it's actually for jurisdiction outside GSA's custody and control. So it's for construction of buildings and repair and alterations for things that are not within our stead, if you will. And still has some really good abilities within reasonable time. The third one is the Economy Act. That one has a much more strict requirements. There are only a few agencies that do require us to use that. And it makes things a little bit more complicated just in terms of timing. It requires that GSA also re-obligate. So remember that picture we had with the different banks, if you will, we have to re-obligate and award a contract to a contractor while the RWA is within the period of obligational authority. So if you have, we'll get into the semantics later. If you have annual funding, that means everything has to happen in that first year. So it does tie our hands a bit, but it is still possible and it's an authority we have to do our work. Okay, 
going to keep going. So another part of appropriations law that governs kind of the backbone of what we do is scope. RWAs have to be detailed and specific. That very first line you see on the slide, that's very telling and very true. We can't just take an RWA that we don't know what we're going to do. It's kind of ironic that I used bank as the term from that picture on the front, right? We are not a bank. We can't have you give us funds and decide later what you'd like to do with it. You have to have the scope identified. So in order to do that, we need to make sure you know what your funds are for. Sometimes agencies have funds that are, have a specific purpose behind them, whether that's how you're given it through your appropriation or that's how it's determined within your agency. But you can't use your funds for a different purpose. And that's identified, again, within the Red Book. That's the authority. We're breaking this down into a simple English as we can, but we encourage you to go and read through these things if you have particular questions or would like more information on them. The, so aside from the use of the funds, also the purpose of the appropriation, the scope has to be clear. So we have to know exactly what it is you want us to do, and we need to document that. So if we know we're going to renovate something, we can't say we're going to renovate something in Washington, D.C. That's not very specific. We would need to know much more information to have a clear description of what's being renovated. Is it a certain floor? Does it involve how much square foot, perhaps? Um, a certain level of specificity is required. Washington, D.C. is a pretty big area, right? So we would need to identify what buildings we're talking about. If you don't know up front, that's okay, but it's not going to be an RWA until we actually can identify that clear scope of what your expectation is so that we can then provide an estimate. So a nice way to remember things behind RWAs, especially when we're talking about scope, is intent, content, and extent. So you need to have an intended purpose. You need to have content that's specific, that scope, right? And the extent, meaning the limitations of the size of the um, boundaries within it and things of that nature. And those two appropriations govern that kind of concept, the intent, content, extent. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to walk through the rest of the appropriation laws. Timing. So this is something we get a lot of questions on. Uh, we have to accept RWAs at the right time. So they can't be accepted too early. And the bona fide needs rule is kind of what dictates that. So Ashley said, we're not a bank, so no parking money. The planning phase of mainly our projects or even for services, the planning has to be complete. So we need to know that we need the work now. So bona fide need, it's confused a lot of times where people think, do I need something? And that's great. Yeah, maybe you need it 10 years from now, but do you need it this fiscal year. So bona fide need is a time test. Do we need it this fiscal year? And GSA attempts to make awards timely. So we have um, some key performance indicators, which we try to follow to get contracts awarded. Uh, it's variable based on the size of the RWA. We also cannot accept an RWA too late. So the Anti-Deficiency Act you're probably familiar with within your own agency regarding contract award. We have to have the money in hand before we can actually obligate it towards a contract. So that means that before GSA can move forward with any kind of services, we have to have the RWA from you first. So we have to have that approved, accepted, signed, fully funded RWA in hand before we can move forward with any kind of solicitation and contract award. That gets a little weird for leases. So it, uh, it is specifically uh, a bona fide need of the year that the lease is signed. Um, so that means RWAs have to be in hand when the lease is signed. So GSA is committing the government, which means all of us, GSA and our customer, to pay for everything that is said in the lease. So if you've outlined uh, construction in that lease agreement, which hopefully you have, then we need the money in hand for construction as well. Even though we're not technically giving it over to the lessor until we pay them, that still has to be in hand. So we're going to take a quick quiz again, see if you understood what bona fide need is. So we're back. There you go. There we go. What constitutes a bona fide need? 
My agency has a likely project need in next fiscal year. My agency has a project need this fiscal year. My agency needs to obligate the funds this fiscal year or we are going to lose them. Treasury is going to take it back. Oh, no. Uh, or my agency has an option to the RWA that we're going to execute next fiscal year. What constitutes a bona fide need? Lots of folks are voting. I'm going to give another moment or two and then I'll share the results. All right, Rachel, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Yay, you guys got that overwhelmingly correct. It is that your agency has a need this fiscal year. So it's not whether or not you need it. You may need things at all sorts of times, but bona fide need dictates what time you need it. So it is a time test. Do you need that work this fiscal year? All right, let's move on. Once we have the RWA, there are some limitations on how we can use it and the timing of when that funding is good till. So per appropriation law, there's something called the period of availability. And I'll, I'll read this awful sentence, uh, not awful, it's very informative, but it is long. On September 30th of the fifth fiscal year, after the period of availability for obligation of a fixed appropriation account ends, the account shall be closed and any remaining balance, whether obligated or unobligated, shall be canceled and thereafter shall not be available for obligation or expenditure for any purpose. So what the heck does that mean? That basically means that funds are good for five years after the expiration date of obligational authority. So what the heck is that? The expiration date of obligational authority is the last day that any agency can write a contract or sign an RWA for a new purpose. So when you're giving GSA an RWA, that is the last date that it could possibly be accepted into our systems. So we cannot have any new obligations with that particular fund after the expiration of obligational authority on that fund. So the period of availability essentially has two phases and I'm gonna break it down in a picture on the next slide. Uh, we'll put it in words first for those who are better with the wording. So there's the period of appropriation availability. And this is the time where you as a customer can create a scope of work and sign an RWA with a new scope on it. So it starts when the appropriation is issued to you and it ends at the expiration date of obligational authority. After that, it's a liquidation period. So period of availability tells us we have five years. So the fifth fiscal year, September 30th of the fifth fiscal year. So we have five years to liquidate that obligation. So you've given us an RWA or maybe GSA isn't involved. You've signed a, a contract. You can still pay out invoices against that contract for another five years after the expiration date of obligational authority on the fund. After that, however, the funds do go back to treasury and they are poof. They are gone doesn't matter what state they're in, if you have awarded them to a contractor and the contractor has delivered work, but you have not paid them yet, those funds are gone and you've got to figure out something else to do. So uh, after five years, it gets real hairy. So let's look at it in a, in a picture format. So that first part, year zero, again, period of funding, appropriation, availability. That's where you as a customer have the authority to obligate the fund for a new purpose. At the end of that fiscal year, that is when your authority to obligate expires. So 930, no more new stuff. Now GSA puts a little extra deadline in, as you are likely all familiar. September 8th every year, we say no more new RWAs or amendments to RWAs because it takes us about three weeks to get through 
uh, first of all, the volume, and second of all, the review. So we have lots of documents to compile. Everything needs to be uh, completely signed before 930. So we need about three weeks to appropriately do all of that work. So we institute an additional deadline of September 8th. After that initial year, we have five years, one, two, three, four, five for liquidation. So that's when we can uh, pay out contracts that we may have awarded for on your behalf. Uh, you can pay us for all the contractual work that's been completed. And then finally, at the end of that five-year period, the money disappears. So you don't wanna get to year six. That is simply no fun at all. So the next slide. Appropriation types. So the appropriation type affects the funding appropriation availability. So that very first portion of appropriation availability is dictated by whether it's annual, multiple year, or no year funds. So that example that we just saw was annual funds, where the obligation is available for one fiscal year. So you as a customer get one year to figure out what you're going to do with that money, write it down, meet the recording statute, get it all signed, and get it formally obligated uh, from your perspective. One year. Multiple year means that you have more than one year, but there's still an end date. So it might be an FY20, FY21, FY22 multiple year fund. So that would be three years, after which you'd still have another five years to liquidate that fund. So in essence, you're getting three plus five, a whole eight years with that particular multiple year fund example. Um, so it is not necessarily always a three-year fund. It's uh, just more than one, but less than infinity. And no year fund, that is the one that is infinity. So that is not bound by fiscal year limitations. So there is no expiration of obligational authority for a no year fund. Those funds are available in perpetuity until they are expensed. However, RWA policy limits uh, the use of funds. So GSA says no matter what fund you're using, we are not going to allow new scope after the initial fiscal year of the RWA. So no scope changes after that first fiscal year, no scope adds. Take us to another quiz. Rebecca, you want to bring up that next one? And there you go. So per appropriations law, how long are funds available for obligation? And we're getting lots of participation in this quiz question too. Give everybody another moment or two. And I'm realizing this is maybe, uh, I think we took this question from a previous training, but it's a little bit tricky of a question. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, you'll, you'll have a good discussion on this one. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everybody. There you go. Okay. So we were looking for what is the period of availability of the fund? I think maybe we uh, threw some people off by saying available for obligation. So obligation you have until the expiration date of obligational authority, but the availability of the fund, which is really what we were after, is five years after the fund's expiration of obligational authority. Ashley, you want to comment? <laughs> I think you're up next. Yes. No, I we could have been a bit more clear in that, so I apologize. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to jump ahead to the next thing. So we went through appropriations law 
Um, and you know that's what governs and dictates a lot of the authorities as we went through the certain particular ones. But the other thing that governs our program and Rachel hinted at it a little bit was our policy manual. So it's the RWA National Policy Manual. The last time it was issued was August of 2020. Being forthcoming and transparent, we're in the middle of making some minor revisions just to clean some stuff up and a couple memos that were processed here and there that we need to now incorporate. Um, but this document, if you will, it's, I think, shy of 200 pages, about 100 pages of actual policy meat, and then a whole bunch of appendices that are great reference material and kind of have direct quotes from different things, many of which are appropriations law related. So you're probably saying, all right, well, why do you have a policy? Appropriations law is sticky enough. Why on earth would you make a policy and make things even stickier? Well, we do it to protect GSA and to make sure we're doing everything we can in the best interest of the government and taxpayer, right? So there's certain things we do to keep things moving. And there's certain things that we do just from an administrative perspective on both sides to make things as seamless as possible. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about within it, which you can reference it, you see the link at the bottom of the slides, that's an excellent resource. We'll hit on it again later in the slide deck, but that's where our policy is. And it is externally available. So you guys can download it and ask questions of the regions as well. It's not just a GSA doc, it's not a hidden secret. So one of the biggest things that we get questions on that we've had to drive home and make very clear, it is not something that's just RWA policy. It's something that's actually driven from appropriations law, but we explain it in our policy so folks can understand and interpret it. It's full funding versus incremental funding, okay? And which one is which? and which one is required, and more importantly, why. So you can see we've got some color coordination on the slide to help draw your attention to what we're really driving home here. Full funding is required. Essentially, we're saying whatever the scope of this RWA is, which we talked about from appropriations law, how we build that, it has to be clear and concise, right? We have to have the intent, the content, and the extent. So we need that information. We're gonna build that out and we're gonna provide an estimate and say, hey, customer, based on the requirements that you gave us, this is how much we anticipate it could cost, right? We have any of our fees involved in there, perhaps a little contingency because nobody's spot on with an estimate because as a reminder, an estimate is just that. It is not a guarantee of price, it is an estimate. So as we start doing things, COVID is a great example, many costs changed over the last two years beyond what anyone could probably imagine. We would not expect our estimates to have forethought that, correct? So here we are. So we're looking at when we're first taking the RWA, you give us your needs, we put together the scope, we give you an estimate, and we say, based on the scope we talked about, it's going to cost $6,000, okay? And you say, oh, shoot, GSA, I only have two. How about I just give you 2000 now? And then I'll give you the other 4,000 next fiscal year. I'm bound to get more money. It's just, it's a crazy time and we're spending our money on all these other things right now. Okay, well, if GSA say, says yes, we've now done incremental funding. You cannot fund the scope over multiple RWAs. You have to, when we take an RWA, it's required to fully deliver that scope of work. So whatever funding is required, we need all that money, full funding, right? Pretty simple, basic words to explain things that are kind of complex in appropriations law. Incremental funding is where we say we're gonna partially fund something over time and it can't be discrete. It's not a discrete deliverable. And it's a very specific term that I'm using for a good reason. The discrete part means we have to be able to deliver it without the other money. So you could say, I only have that $2,000 and we say, okay, well, why don't we look at the scope and see if we can break part of it out? Maybe there's a design element. We can do some design work first and it's gonna be smaller than $2,000, but some, let's take that RWA now. Then in the following fiscal year, if you don't get money, that $4,000 that you thought you would need for the construction element as an example, and I'm using very small dollar figures, I realize, but let's say you don't get that $4,000, that's okay. We could still deliver the scope of that first RWA, which was just for design, okay? So that's not a violation. So phasing things and breaking them apart into discrete deliverables is completely acceptable, so long as it can stand on its own. It needs to be something that we can start and finish with that funding, okay? So that's where we are. That's the difference between full funding and incremental funding. Full funding required. Incremental funding not permitted, okay? So 
How about antecedent liability? It's another fun term that goes slightly hand in hand with full funding and incremental funding because people confuse them, being totally honest, right? So an antecedent liability is something that happens when something was fully funded. We had an RWA, you gave us an RWA, the scope was specific, we gave you an estimate, you gave us all the money. I'm gonna use COVID just because of where we are with time. The price of materials drastically increased because obviously supply and demand were very much impacted across the entire world, right? So the cost of something we anticipated in 2019, as we delivered it in 2020 and 2021, one, we had trouble getting it, it impacts schedules, right? Two, the cost went up. So gosh, Ashley, does that mean we were incrementally funding it because now we need more money to deliver the same project? No, it means you have an antecedent liability. The cost of delivering that original scope of work has gone up. There's no changes to the scope. Nothing has changed about what you've asked us to deliver. What you asked us originally with that first RWA hasn't changed. You still need that full design and construction and all the elements we talked through in it, right? But it's no longer gonna be $6,000. It's gonna be $10,000. It's an antecedent liability. So you can see we have on the slide some good examples of kind of real world examples of things that may happen where we would come back and say it's an antecedent liability. And then we have to work through the appropriate way to fund an antecedent liability, which we're gonna get into more in our amendment section, which is later on in the um, slide deck. So I don't wanna kind of jump us in there, but the biggest thing to understand is antecedent liability and incremental funding are two totally different things. One of them is acceptable because price of things goes up. That's your unforeseen cost. That's an antecedent liability. It actually means going back. It's kind of the translation of it and incremental funding is not permitted. And then just something again, since we're talking about RWA policy, there's times when we can be more um, specific in our policy, more stringent, permit less in our policy for different reasons within our own agency. And one of them is increases to the RWA scope of work after the end of that initial fiscal year requires a new RWA regardless of funding type. So even if you provide us funding that is still legally available for new obligation, whether it be multiple year or no year funding in the next fiscal year, per policy, we do not permit changes to the scopes at that time. You can't amend it, it's a new RWA. So if you say, I wanna add something to it, that would be a new RWA. Fiscal law would provide a little bit more flexibility, but our policy is more strict. And we do that to make sure we're able to deliver projects as efficiently as possible. If we have scopes that are ever changing and being added onto, it impacts the schedule and everything else thereafter. So it's our way of making sure we're, we have those discrete pieces identified. All right. So the next thing I want to get into is a kind of dissertation, if you will, we have in the policy. We have a lot of information about it that separates things. And it's our way of explaining whether or not we're doing project type work or whether we're doing more service type work. So it's severable versus non-severable as the designation. And you're asked when you submit a work request, which we'll get into to GSA, we ask you to kind of help us understand what you think it is. So the basis is making sure you understand some of this. As we move through the process, you'll understand some of these acronyms and such. They're a little early in the presentation for some of it, but. A severable RWA requires an overtime utility estimate. Doesn't mean it's necessarily for overtime utilities. That's just the name that we gave those estimates when we first started things. So that's one trigger that could help you identify what I have. If you get an overtime utility estimate, you have a severable RWA. If you get a summary cost estimate, which is the SCE acronym that you see, that denotes that you have a non-severable RWA. So it's just one helpful thing as you move through requirements you can understand. So the, the basic difference is that severable is something that's continuing or recurring in nature and you get that benefit each time. It could be overtime utilities. It could be um, washing windows is always an easy one. You get a benefit whether you wash all the windows or only the third floor. You get a benefit if the third floor is done and then the window washer isn't able to wash anymore because it rains. You still have that benefit. So that's where we are with that severable side, right? It's a service. Non-severable, on the other hand, is something that has that end result. So not like window washing, it would be more like an actual construction project. You can't go into space that is not fully built out for you, correct? If you have asked us to renovate space and something happens with the contract and we run out of money because we didn't estimate properly, 
correct? And we go back to you and you don't have any more money, you might not be able to use the space because you need to wait until the RWA is fully delivered. So it's a single outcome product. It can even be a report. If there's a survey or a report you've asked us to do, they can also be non-severable because there's a deliverable at the end. There's no benefit, if you will, in the middle. It's something you receive the benefit when you have it in totality. So there's also differences behind them in terms of the periods of performance, or the length of time that we have to actually execute them and spend the money. I'm not gonna get into the specifics with the types because I know that's on the next couple of slides. I'm gonna let Rachel touch on it. I think that's an easier way to see it on the next slides. But the general basis behind severable and non-severable is one is more service oriented and the other one is more project oriented. Rachel, Let's look pause. at the different types of severable RWAs. So we have either recurring R, or non-recurring N. So recurring services, non-recurring services, kind of doesn't, um, GSA picks the type. You guys don't have to know what all these types are, but we get a lot of questions about what's that mean. So recurring just means that GSA has to base it on a projected cost. So we already have contracts awarded, usually for overtime utilities in GSA owned space. So it's, basically exclusively what our types are for, overtime utilities and GSA open space. So we already have that contract awarded with the utility company. We end up um, estimating that service year after year, and we do not have a separate contract for it. So they are not independently contracted. Therefore, the fee is a bit lower. It's a flat fee of $500. And that gets billed 100% in that first billing cycle. Our type RWAs are also tied to the fiscal year. So services cannot extend past the end of the current fiscal year and they close at the end of that fiscal year. N type RWAs are, uh, when they're severable, are for non recurring services where we actually have to issue some sort of contract or award a task order or some sort of contractual action to get that work done. So that's usually for janitorial services, uh, overtime utilities, and leased space. Uh, you might also see some other things in there, preventative maintenance, some weird uh, severable services crop up every once in a while, but um, they can cross fiscal years as long as everything is scoped and awarded within that original fiscal year and they get the full fee applied. Go to the next slide. Non-severable types, A, B, N, they all work the same. You guys are probably most used to seeing the N type. It just means it's a project. Uh, GSA categorizes A and B for reporting to Congress, essentially. So Congress wants to know how much GSA is spending in customer money in conjunction with our own funds. So A type RWAs designate that we, GSA, are split funding it with our repair and alteration fund, which we coin BA54. And then B type means that it's related to some sort of prospectus project that GSA has on the books. So A, B, N, they all work the same to you guys for non-severable projects. It's just how GSA fun, split funds it with our own money. Next slide. F types. F types are interesting. Uh, they are for miscellaneous work. So all those appropriation laws that we talked about, about having a very detailed scope of work and needing to have valid detailed cost support and all that sort of stuff kind of goes out the window why can we do F-types? How is this possibly in compliance with appropriation law? Well, the reason is that everything has to be actually recorded, 100% completed, physically completed within the fiscal year that the RWA is accepted. And that is the only reason we can kind of get through those weird appropriation laws with this very weird type of RWA. So these RWAs don't require a detailed cost estimate. They don't require a scope of work. It should say miscellaneous when you submit your work request. It can be for one or more routine projects or services, small projects or services. So under $25,000 for each transaction, including GSA fees. So routine means key, reeking door locks or maybe somebody spilled coffee uh, or something else staining on the carpet and you need to replace carpet, uh, perhaps 
there's a hole knocked in the wall from a door that got slammed, something like that. Uh, those kinds of one-off projects, small things can be put on an F-type. The total amount of an F-type cannot exceed $250,000, and you cannot use an F-type as contingency towards any other projects because that would be incremental funding, as we discussed earlier. And then again, I'm going to restate that very important point. Work has to be 100% completed by fiscal year end. F-types are automatically marked complete on September 30th of the fiscal year in which they were accepted. So that means in order to get the work done and paid to contractors that we really have to have work done by about mid-August for that mid-August billing cycle. So don't be surprised if GSA starts asking you around now to finish it up. What else you got? We're gonna send your F-type money back so that maybe you could use it before the September 8th deadline. So talk with your GSA contact, your PM POC, if you have any F-types, discuss what you plan to get finished on that F-type this fiscal year, and then ask them to close it, to complete it, to give you your money back so that you can use it. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna automatically close it on September 30th anyway. And as we just talked through all those obligation rules, you can't use that fund for new obligations anymore after the end of the, this fiscal year, usually. All right, anything else there? No, all right, RITA and eRITA. So we're transitioning into process now. So eRITA is the customer version of our RITA application. So RITA stands for RW, RWA Entry and Tracking Application just like the government to have acronyms within acronyms. So eRITA, that little E just stands for external. So that means that you as a customer are logging into the, the system from outside of GSA's firewall. So that's all that means. It's the exact same system. It's the exact same information. You are just logging in externally. E-RITA is required for all federal customers to use to submit work requests and RWAs to the public building service. It contains all of our financial information, all the documents related to your RWAs. So if you are ever curious as to how much money has been spent and how much is left, you can log in and see that data, which is updated four times a day. And uh, you can sign up for training get access to eRITA uh, with edit access or with read only access. So we saw that about, I think it was like 46% of you maybe didn't have a user ID yet. This is how you get it. So uh, go to gsa.gov slash eRITA. And then you can see that box on the left there. It's got how to access eRITA. How do I access it? So there's a sign up process. It's uh, pretty simple. We have to make sure that you have a need to know and you are a valid government employee and all that jazzy stuff. And then you'll be hooked up with a login. And that second red box is where you would actually log into eRITA. All right, so we've talked about the appropriation stuff. We've talked about what's in RWA. We've talked about our system, but we've alluded to quite a bit, the process. So all the pieces we put together and we map, map them through an entire process, which utilizes different things within our system. So we're gonna talk about work requests versus an RWA, which I'll get into next. But one of the most essential pieces of understanding kind of the RWA process is understanding the different status labels, if you will. And it seems very important to understand, you see everything on the left-hand side of this, those are actual status labels within eRITA. So when you go in there and you pull up your work request or RWA, it's gonna say one of these statuses. This is a great handy chart to have because then you know, what does that mean? You can see everything that happened before it, everything that needs to happen for it to move forward, and understand kind of whose court things are in. It actually even shows you in eRITA exactly um, who the baton is with, if you will, whether it's with you or whether it's with GSA. We do have eRITA training, so we're not gonna get into all of that semantics, but we do have a lot of great training and resources for that. But just understanding where you are. So generally speaking, a customer is gonna go in and they're gonna enter what we call work request information. Notice I'm using the term work request. Another acronym with similar letters in a slightly different order. Yes, I know. Oh, 
not trying to complicate things, but it truly is your request. It's like your order. You're putting into GSA and saying, I have a need. Here's the amount of information I have, which could be a lot. You could have really done a lot of scope development and planning and such with your own folks, or it could be very little and say, I know the space that we're in, we need to completely reconfigure because we have more folks teleworking. So perhaps our footprint needs to be smaller. So we need to renovate and consolidate folks. So maybe that's all you know, because maybe that's what your job is, is just to fit everybody in there. And that's fine. You're going to go in, you're going to save your information. That pre-planning status, basically like a draft email. We don't even see it. So you can go in there, you can put your information in, let it hang out in there, save it in draft right? Until you have enough information or until you're ready, send it across the pond, if you will, to GSA. Then when you're ready, you're going to actually hit send to GSA. It's still only going to be, I think it's seven pieces of information. Some of them are like, who are you? Who do you work for? Is this severable or non-severable? Remember that slide I told you you would have to maybe be able to pick. If you're wrong, it's okay. We'll help you. But helping us determine where we get beyond that. So you're going to send it to us you'll get an email. It's gonna tell you, congratulations, you've submitted this to us, now hang tight. It's gonna feel like an eternity, I promise you it's not. We take, typically it's less than two days, but it can take up to five business days for us to assign a project manager. So we take what you had, we assign a PM, and that PM is then going to be the one that's helping build the requirements. So whether you had a lot of detail, very little detail, or you wanna talk things out in a lot of scope development, doesn't matter the size of the project, we're going to assign a PM. Then you're going to be in that big box in the middle, which as you can see, a lot of stuff happens. Okay. You're going to have your PM. They're going to work directly with you to develop things. Then everything's going to be documented in the system. And we're even going to link an estimate. Remember how I used those terms earlier, the acronyms OUE and SCE? Those are our estimates. So we actually use that. So we have a standard estimate template. So we take whatever estimate we may have, the IGE that's created, sometimes you guys provide estimates and then we do our due diligence to make sure they make sense and are fair and reasonable. And we put it into a summary cost estimate. So it's a standard level summary template and link that to the work request. Okay, what happens next? Well, then we're gonna send it back to you and say, here you go. The scope has now been formally estimated. And if you customer would like to fund this, this is what it's gonna cost. Remember full funding? If you don't have enough money, you can't do it. You would have to go back to the PM and say, we need to de-scope. We need to take some things out because I can't have incremental funding. You're not going to accept it. So again, pulling in terminology that we've talked through and kind of walked through so you know where we are on things. Then hopefully you're going to get the funds. It's going to be scoped to a level that makes sense to you. You're going to provide the funds to GSA all within our application. No more paper forms, no more bouncing things back and forth on emails. You literally go into the application. You need data entry access to be able to do this. So if you don't have that and it's your job to do it, you should get it. Typically it's financial folks doing this. They're putting the accounting information in. The front end could be a different person putting the project pieces in. This part could be a financial person that's putting in your treasury account symbol, your um, billing office code, your financial contacts, all of that information, the actual funding information, right? Everything goes in, you send it back across to GSA, okay? You don't have a fully executed RWA yet. All you have is something we're reviewing, right? You've provided funding. You have no obligation yet. From a financial perspective, you have a commitment. You would have committed things on your side, but you don't have an obligation, right? We still have to do a couple things. We're going to review it. Remember appropriations law and that massive policy manual I talked about? We got to make sure everything you provided and what you want us to do is in lockstep with those two things typically takes us about 15 business days, which if you put that on a calendar is almost a month. Several of you I'm sure are saying, holy moly, that sounds forever. Well, there's a lot of things that we're looking at and there's a very large number of RWAs that come in. So we're just saying that it may take that long. Traditionally, they can go much quicker. Once you're in July, I would say that is more the norm because we have, most folks have been out of the CR now long enough. They've developed bigger requirements and we're able to fund them now. So we're seeing a large uptick in the RWAs coming in. So we're down in that green box in the bottom, that pending new status, we're reviewing things and then we're gonna add our information. Again, what used to be on the form that you saw written out, it would be us filling out page two, we're doing it in the system. Everything's done in e -Rita. 
and then it's going to print out on that pretty form. As soon as we have all of our information in there, it's going to be routed for signatures. It goes to you guys first. Does your We'll get into signatures later, but your folks will apply their signature. It sends the package to our folks and they apply their signature. Then we have a valid obligation. We have a formal RWA. So we've moved from the work request at the top all the way down to the RWA. Perfect sense, right? I'm just kidding. I realize that's a lot and it's tough to understand. So we're gonna look at it from, what's the difference between those two acronyms, the WR and the RWA? So they are not one and the same. One builds into the other one, they do work together, but they are two different things. So what exactly are they? The work request, remember the front end of our process piece, that's where you're identifying that you have a need. It's your, I have a need, I wanna to talk to you, I wanna start the conversation to build requirements. There's no formal agreement. There's no requirement on your side to do anything, right? It's you said I have a need, all right? The RWA, on the other hand, that's the formal agreement between us. That's where the obligation has occurred and we've gotten into business together because you've said, I have a need, which you outlined in your work request. You provided all the funding information and we accepted it by putting our signature as well. So the RWA is the formal agreement and it documents an obligation. The work request, not a formal agreement, but it starts building the process. What do they look like? How do you know the difference? A work request starts with a W and then has a seven digit number after it that's actual digits. Same seven digits carry forward when it becomes an RWA, except now it has the alphabet of RWAs that Rachel was going through earlier, whether it's an N type, an R type, an A type, whatever it might be, that will be the letter in the front instead of W. So that helps you understand whether you're talking about a work request or an RWA. So what does it do? Well, the work request, it gets you a PM. So you know who in GSA you're going to be working with, and it gets you in the door to start the requirements development, which then leads to, hopefully, what you're able to make in RWA. But remember, we can give you all the information, we can work on the scope together, and you can then say, I don't have the funding to do this, or gosh, I really want to do this, but I'm going to move it to a priority for a different fiscal year. And that's fine, we just need to have that communication back and forth. But what's the difference between that work request piece and what it does and the RWA. Well, in the RWA, we have a formal interagency agreement. Remember, OMB has blessed our RWA form and said yes. So that means that we are required now to deliver on that in a reasonable time. We can't just hold on to your money and just sit on it. We need to actually deliver the project, the scope of work that you've asked us to do. And you're going to reimburse us for the cost of that. That's what it sets up. So a work request, does it need funding? Nope. Remember, it's that seven special pieces of information. And RWA, does that need funding? Well, absolutely. We can't say we're gonna do something for free. That definitely would never happen in the government, right? We need to have an estimate and have the funding that supports that. And what RWA rules apply to each of them? The work requests, nothing. You could ask us to do something that we say, yeah, that's not something within G PBS's purview. We're not gonna be able to support that. And we turn it back. The RWA, on the other hand, we can't be at that point anymore. All of the rules apply from appropriations law that we started with into the policy and now formatting into our process. So I know this is a lot. I tried to hit the high points instead of jumping too far into the weeds with it, but I'm going to keep going. So, whoops, I went too far. Don't read ahead. <laughs> so an important thing we wanted to share with you guys from a visual perspective is one of the communications that you'll get. Certain points in that process that I outlined the green and red process that you saw, certain trigger points happen within our system. This is a big one. It's the trigger that's saying a PM has been assigned, okay? So this is sent both to the PM that is being assigned as well as to the customer. And this is your first means of knowing who you're gonna work with. So you send us a work request and we say it's up to five business days to assign a project manager. This is your person you ask questions to when you are starting to build the requirements. Some regions might have it be someone and it may change. It might be assigned to Ashley at the start. And then as I start talking to the customer and unpacking things, realize, wow, this is something Rachel's really good at. It's her exp expertise. We talk to our leadership and they switch it. That's fine. It's not the person that's always gonna be in charge of it. It's just your contact. So it's important you know that. But the other thing, reason we wanted to share this one in particular is there's no action on your part. So when you receive this email, it's not, okay, now what do I do? In theory, the GSA PM should be reaching out to you 
to start asking questions to build those requirements. If you don't hear from them, you absolutely can reach out to them. This is not saying don't. It's just saying when you receive this, there's technically no action in your court. The GSA PM should be taking action to work through, okay, what are your requirements? If you sent a lot of documentation and information with your initial work request, chances are the PM may not reach out right away because they're going to digest it, right? If you have something that has a lot of documentation, they're going to want to look through that, digest it, see what it is, and then reach out. If you've sent in the work request that says, I really don't know what I want, I just know, remember my example of COVID happened, we're now going to have more folks teleworking, we need to reduce the space we have and reconfigure, I don't even know where to start, the PM might reach out a little sooner because they need to ask you questions. How many do you have? What's your footprint now? What do you need? You know, things like that. So just an awareness that this is not necessarily something you need to do, but it's who you contact when you have questions. When you say, I haven't heard from GSA. Well, in this case, you know who your PM is and you should reach out to them. All right. I think it is time for another quiz question. Rebecca, could you pull that in please? Okay, true or false, a work request is a formal agreement between PDS and a customer. Lots of votes coming in here. <clears throat> We'll give it another moment. All right, we'll end it now with 127 people voting. And there are your results. Okay, so we generally did pretty good. A couple folks maybe didn't totally get it, but that's okay. That's expected. Again, lots of information that we've thrown at you. So to remind you, a work request is not a formal agreement between, I'm gonna close this so you guys can see it, between PBS and the customer. I think I can go backwards. Here we go. I'm gonna go here. Remember, not a formal agreement. We're just saying I have the need versus the actual RWA. That's your formal agreement. That's your obligation that's happening. Your work request is building up to the RWA. Okay, Rachel? Well, I think before we get into scope, so you'll see this is a very enticing slide, but we're gonna take a really quick, like four minute, four minute bio break. Please come back at uh, 10 after the hour for a very rousing discussion of how to write a good scope of work.
All right. Shall we keep moving? Okay, let's talk about scope development, requirements development. So this is something where GSA is your expert, but we need your help because we don't know what your expectations are. So GSA and the customer should jointly develop all of the requirements. We need to do some sort of tenant needs interview to figure out what it is that you really need. And hopefully the project manager is asking you questions about your core need. So maybe you say, I need an outlet, but what you really want is somewhere to plug in a refrigerator, in which case maybe it needs its own circuit, that type of thing. So getting at the actual use of the requirement is going to be uh, very important. That scope also needs to be specific, clear, and discrete. So it needs to be a fully fledged thing that will provide a benefit. So that's all about the recording act that we talked about earlier. And we should be discussing the target budget and schedule with you as well. So if you have some schedule deadlines that you absolutely need to adhere to, we're going to have to discuss whether or not that's possible and the cost implications. So schedule changes usually do have a budget impact. As Ashley mentioned, when we were talking about appropriation law, elements of a good scope include intent, content, and extent. So intent is the core purpose or objective of the project. This is something that we don't do a great job of on a lot of our RWAs. So it's really, really helpful to define your overarching objective because that will give you kind of a backbone of understanding if you need to, um, if there's any antecedent liability issues. So if there's something that gets to that intent, it's a little easier to justify that uh, the funding needs to be spent for antecedent liability. Content, of course, is the specifics. We're pretty good at that. We define, all right, we need carpet, we need paint, all that sort of stuff. And then extent, we could improve on that as well. So location, area address, the square footage, maybe even the uh, full-time employee count. So if you're doing a new space and you're not sure exactly how big the lease is gonna be, you could say, well, we're getting a new lease space for 50 FTEs. And that would be to, a way to limit uh, the extent of that scope. Few other weird little caveats here at the bottom, options. Options lack bona fide need until the fiscal year they are exercised. So if GSA is looking at doing a contract option for some sort of portion of the scope, that should not be included on an RWA until the fiscal year in which we are going to exercise that option. So it gets real tricky if we're doing CMC contracts, stuff like that. Uh, so PMs on the line, keep an eye out for options and be very, very cautious when combining options in RWAs. It's not impossible, but you do have to be conscious of the limitation because essentially they uh, become RWA option all the same fiscal year. No scope creep. You have to outline all the scope on your RWA, be really explicit about it, and then that is it. That's all you get to do. You cannot use leftover funding for anything else. Uh, if bids come in real low and you do have excess funds, they are excess and they have to be sent back to you as a customer. They cannot be, uh, you can't just add scope or use money because you have it. And the scope is locked at the end of the current fiscal year, regardless of fund type. So we do not allow you to add scope to any RWAs after the end of the fiscal year in which the RWA was accepted. GSA is gonna provide a cost estimate. So based on that scope, it's going to be, uh, it's gonna have a level of accuracy that is going to be reflective of the scope of work. So if your description of requirements and your uh, scope that you've developed is not very specific, your estimate may not be specific enough for us to actually accept an RWA. So you do need to get that level of specificity in there in both the scope and the estimate. So GSA is gonna to put together a detailed estimate, put that into a summary cost estimate or overtime utility cost estimate, which is going to uh, include GSA's fee. So we charge an RWA management fee to cover standard project management effort and financial services. 
So that's going to be worked by the GSA project team, PM, COR, sponsors, subject matter experts, people reviewing the design documents, et cetera. And then it's overhead for the RWA program. So my time, Ashley's time, the RITA system upkeep itself, all of our finance people in Fort Worth uh, and other parts of the country, all of the time to manage and do all the financial activities and background stuff on those RWAs is included in that fee. There's a minimum fee of $500 and it applies to all RWAs and all work with the exception of personal property. So furnitures, fixtures, and equipment, which would include cubicles or whiteboards, projector screens, cell phones, laptops, stuff like that. We do not charge a fee on those as a static fee, but we are required to charge for services. So if you wanna go to the next page, direct labor and travel. So GSA has to charge for our time to cover anything which is not included in our fee. So GSA, if we do in-house design, so instead of hiring an architecture firm or we do in-house M&I services instead of hiring a construction management firm or any management or contracting of any kind for personal property. So because we don't charge a fee on it, we have to uh, charge exact costs. So furniture design is a cost of furniture as well. So if we're doing that in-house, that counts as furniture. Uh, and then any travel. So travel outside of 50 miles from the nearest GSA field office. So there is a full list of all those different um, scope items that GSA has to direct charge for in our pricing policy. And what this means is that GSA has to put together exact costs and bill them every pay period to our customers. So you're gonna see those show up in the summary cost estimate um, on whatever line is most appropriate. So if we're doing in-house design, you're gonna see design in there. If it's for something else, it might just be on something called a, a um, direct labor line. Okay. So once GSA has finished the cost estimate, we're gonna link it to a work request and you're gonna get this message. So this message you do need to take action on this is the one that says, hey, GSA has done the estimate and you need to go look at it and fill out your RWA with your financial information if you are okay with it. So if you have questions about the estimate, you're not sure that the scope is right, you're not sure that GSA really uh, captured your ideas as you intended, talk with us about it. Reach out to your PMPOC. We can redo that estimate as many times as it takes to get it right. Um, and at this point, once you receive this message, if you're really not ready to fund it, that's okay too. It can sit there unfunded. We're going to follow up with you periodically. I think askrwa at gsa.gov sent out a message recently for things that were funded. And we said, hey, what you doing? Are you going to fund this or are you going to push it to next year? Do you need to cancel it? Do you really need this work anymore? And so it's okay for it to sit in pending status like that in that planning estimate status, but we will follow up with you to make sure that you uh, that you have everything you need. So once you get this message though, this is your notification that the ball is now in your court and it is up to you to either fund it, cancel it or push it off till the next fiscal year. Okay, so We've kind of walked through the process we're pretty far in and now we want to talk about the rwa intake and submission so we're moving from work request to rwa right remember our terminology so just sticking with us there so how are work or excuse me how are rwa sent good lord so first of all everything is done in e -Rita. i think i've probably said that five times and rachel's probably said that five times but in case you weren't sure there is no more form to do outside the system you got to do it in the system so everything's in e -Rita. You don't have to think about what goes in which block. We do that for you, right? When we transfer it onto the form within the system. So everything's done through eRita. A couple of people I saw a few questions pop into the chat and the Q&A. If you need access to eRita, www.gsa.gov backslash eRita. 
go there. It'll help you with all the information. The previous slide that Rachel went over had access information for you to detail all that. We can't unfortunately just say, sure, here you go. You have to actually fill some stuff out. So you're gonna send your work request and RWA, both parts done within the system. You're gonna put all your financial information in ERITA. So after you've had that summary cost estimate or overtime utility estimate, like Rachel alluded to, you're gonna go in the system and you're gonna add your financials. It could be your CFO folks, might not be you, but whomever in your agency, you need to make sure you coordinate with them, can go in. Different people can access the same work request in RWA. Go in, put all your financials in, and then you're gonna click this magic button at the bottom that says send to GSA. It's gonna generate an email that I'll show you a visual of here in a few minutes, but that email is gonna say that it's been sent to GSA for acceptance. So at that point, it's the old school version of those of you who have been doing this with GSA previously, where you filled out page one and put your signature and sent it by email to GSA. That is everything that has happened. It's just happened in the system. There's no signature yet because we've changed that part of the process a little bit. Because many of you who may have been around, we don't change process just to do it. We change it to make it more efficient and to improve the entire overall process. So doesn't it seem to make sense that we would do this next section I'm gonna talk about reviewing before we have you sign it? Some of you may have been around long enough that you recall having an RWA that was signed and GSA comes back and says, yikes, this is wrong. You wrote this TAS and that doesn't coordinate to the funding that you've provided. It actually is different. Oh gosh, you need to correct it and get it signed again. There's nothing worse than hearing you need to go through all the signature hoops for a second, third or fourth time, right? So this is an attempt to make sure we're not doing that. We're both doing our respective entry and review before signature, okay? So you've sent it to GSA, you're twiddling your thumbs waiting. About 15 business days, remember that is not 15 days, it's 15 business days, which is like three weeks, almost a month. We're gonna be reviewing it. Internally, we're gonna be looking at stuff. We're gonna be looking at the information you provided. We have a different team of folks that review the information than the folks that put it together. Makes sense, right? We're going to have our RWA managers play a key role in this, looking through the information for errors. So there could be a blatant error, whether it was on purpose or not. We're going to have the GSA PM make sure they put all the documentation in the system. Good news there is you guys can see that. There's an actual documentation tool within eReda, so you can see all the documents related to the work request in RWA that kind of build upon it. So you can see where you started and where you ended up. And you've got that for audit and just for background as different people come and go in different positions. So the documents will be compiled. We obviously have some requirements in terms of our review internally, just like all of you likely have external reviews that you do to make sure things are done and approved before you send them over. Once everything's approved and our reviews are done internally, we're going to route it for signature via DocuSign. Why is it important to keep telling you all these different system names, right? Gosh, it's so confusing. Well, there's good reason. The signatures are not actually done in Erita. So that's the good news. Whoever is signing it doesn't need to go into the system. So if you have senior level folks signing based on dollar values, they don't need to bother themselves, shall we say, with getting access and learning a new system. DocuSign is something that's universally used. We use it outside of government, just as much as inside of government, where you get an email and you click a button. We'll show you some more on that here in a few minutes. But the signature routing happens, it goes to you guys first. Whoever is the signature authority person on your side that you've identified, they're gonna say, say they approve it, hit the button, it applies their digital signature, which is a valid signature, and it automatically then sends it to the GSA signature approving authority, and they're gonna do the same thing. Those signatures are gonna be captured within the RWA, within eReta, we're gonna capture that information and put it on, like I said, we complete the form for you, it's gonna be on there. And then GSA is gonna send an acceptance letter. So that's your trigger of you're going to now know you have that valid obligation. Things should be obligated on your books at this time. And cool thing, it sends you the actual completed form. So you have an actual piece of paper, if you will, to make the obligation. You're not then tracking back in the system to do it. So you can forward it to whomever is doing that on your side. So a big part of this whole process, there's things we're looking for, there's things you're looking for, there's internal hoops and external hoops, we each have them, right? Our process, our change, change management, risk management, we've got all kinds of different forces coming different directions. Patience, right? Everybody needs things done yesterday, everybody's up against a different deadline, a different clock, and a different boss. But 
we need your patience just like you need our patience. So Rachel was getting onto the fact of we've done all of this legwork for you and sent you an estimate. And now we're sitting here waiting. We need to be patient and not knock on your door consistently and incessantly. We've done everything we can to avoid that. We even have opportunities for you to literally say in the system, this is not a need for this year. This is for a future year so that we can, again, not focus upon it. We can forget about it till next year and then come back and talk. But patience is something we both need. As soon as the PM is able to get the schedule up and rolling, they're going to start working toward procurement. They can actually use the funds. Once there's an obligation, once we've sent that acceptance letter and that dual signed RWA, the funds are ready for use. But procurement is not always the simplest process. It depends on which procurement action our contracting team determines is best. Some take longer than others and they have to put the packages together. So just because we accept the RWA today does not mean we're gonna make an award tomorrow. Highly unlikely, right? So just manage your expectation with all parts of the process. But the biggest thing is talk to your project manager or PMPOC, right? If you have questions on where you are, what the hangup is, what's, what's happening with it, you haven't heard from them, reach out. If you get an out of office or an undeliverable, it happens. Reach out to the RWA manager, figure out what's going on. Who am I supposed to talk to, right? We don't want you sitting waiting, thinking something's happening that's not, but that's your leg into knowing who to talk to. Go to your PMPOC. Okay, so told you I was gonna share some visuals with you. So this is that customer sent to RW, sent RWA to GSA. So this is the one I alluded to where you hit that click send to GSA button. This email comes out, you guys are copied on it. So back to what Rachel and I alluded to, there's no action for you on this. You took action, now the ball's back in GSA's court. It's up to the project manager or PMPOC. Sometimes it's not a project manager, it's other folks. It's up to that person to then take action to start the internal review process within GSA. So you'll see some links and some other stuff mentioned on here, they're internal. Because remember, the action on this is for GSA. So it's not intended for you to try to fill out this acceptance request form. It's not your job. That's just our way of cataloging and connecting the dots between a couple things. So encourage you to see this and know where you are in the process and appreciate no action on you at this point. Okay. And the next one is an important one that you'll also receive. I use you loosely, meaning the signature authority person will be receiving this. So whoever you identify as the person that has the authority to sign the RWA. Once everything has been approved, we hit a button in eReta and it routes it for signature. Remember, it goes outside through DocuSign. This is what the email is going to look like that your signature authority will receive. They're going to click on that orange block there that says review document. They'll scroll down in it and there's an opportunity to sign and it collects their digital signature. They're good to go. That's it. You can do it from a mobile device. You can do it from your laptop a huge docking station computer, whatever you might have, anything works, right? So there shouldn't be any delay. You don't need system access. You don't need DocuSign accounts. You don't need to create all these different things. You can go in, knows who you are, you go, okay? We sign after you. That's another important thing that I think folks get tripped up on. They say, hey, I need to see your signature. Okay, well, we have to sign second. That's just the way the process works right now, okay? You know everything is done because you get that acceptance letter. The signature package is taken from DocuSign. It sends it back into eReta, and then we know to send out the acceptance letter. So it's timing-wise the perfect time. It gives you that information. It's where we wanted you to understand with DocuSign, kind of where we are in the email that you'll see. So we alluded to earlier, September 8th, I believe we talked about. It seems important to unpack it and help everybody understand especially based on where we are in the fiscal year. This is something that is internal within GSA that we have implemented. It's been about four years now that we've put a hard deadline and it's been very effective in managing things for us and for our customers to help manage that expectation. I know I saw some folks in the chat say, gosh darn, it takes forever for GSA to review my stuff. Well, if you think about how many people may still be sending things on September 29th and September 30th, if we didn't have these deadlines in place, our folks would never sleep. So being realistic, making sure that we're doing our due diligence. Remember, appropriations law, RWA policy, 
lots of other governing things that Im impact the process, right? We wanna make sure we're doing things above board that is to the credit of both us and you guys. We don't wanna do something and later figure out, wow, that was a really poor requirements development um, put together, right? That it didn't work out so well for us. So we wanna make sure we're doing everything up front. That's the reason why we have these deadlines. So the fully executable RWA is what the deadline impacts. So that is where we are in the process in terms of you have hit send to GSA. Remember I talked about that, you hit that button and you get an email that's not for your action. It's for GSA to then do our review before we route for signature. That's what you need to do. If you have not done that by September 8th, we are not going to be reviewing your RWA or your amendment, regardless of the color of money. Doesn't matter if it's no year, multiple year that's still available next year, because guess what? We can still look at that on October 1st and make the actual review and do things on that time. It's not time sensitive, if you will. So September 8th is our date. As Rachel said, it was midnight Eastern time. Get things over. After that, that leaves us, remember that 15 business days? It's about what's left in the fiscal year after that, right? It gives us 15 business days to get through everything that has come in nationwide. And that's our goal because we don't want you guys waiting to make the obligation on your books for us to send an acceptance letter. We don't want to make the system fall apart because everybody's doing so much in it. And we certainly want to make sure we're doing our due diligence to make sure we're taking the right things. So back to that fully executable RWA, what does it mean? I talked about the fact that it hit that button. That's how we actually track it. We're able to see they didn't hit the button yet. They put the information in, they didn't hit the button. You might get an email then, right? But you have a defined scope of work that you've talked about with GSA. So on September 6th, if you come to us with, here's my work request, I'm putting in the system for the first time, but don't worry, GSA, I did all of the scope development on my own, not going to fly. We have to actually be an active participant in developing and reviewing the scope, right? So defining that scope, reviewing it with GSA, that happened. Funding, we provided you an estimate and you provided appropriate funding also discussed with GSA, it was sent through eRita, hit that magic button, send to GSA. Doesn't need to be signed, okay? At this point, it is still a work request. It is not gonna be an RWA until we actually get the signatures on it. That's when it moves from work request to RWA. The only exceptions to this deadline are severable service RWAs. So if you have overtime utility needs that already happened that you are finalizing and confirming, or if you have needs that arise in the month of September, that is fine. Those are things that we um, can review and process without haste. Health and life safety or property situations, anything that is a true life safety situation, those are things that we can consider reviewing and accepting beyond September 8th. So by September 8th, GSA is not going to apply our signature and you're not going to apply yours. It just means that you need to have the entire package sent over and have all your financial information in and click that button. If that has not happened, and it's not one of those two very rare exceptions, there's no need to argue with the region. It is a rule that we have in place for a reason. They all come up to central office and central office makes the determination. That is not an exception. You forgot, somebody was out of the office, you couldn't get a hold of the PM. We've heard every excuse in the book. September 8th is the date. Okay, another thing to identify or understand. Let's say we have the whole package, we've sent it to you, and then you send it back and we're reviewing it. And now it's September 15th. If there's a lot of changes that need made, in other words, it was put together probably on September 7th or 8th, and it's not necessarily done with as much due diligence as we maybe should have, we're probably gonna turn that one back and say, sorry, okay? If there's something minor that's in it, that as we're reviewing it later in September, we may come back and say, can you fix this? There was an inconsistency. That's gonna be fine and we'll work through those. They should be few and far between. But those situations where it's, it was a rush to put it in and that's clear and we're basically saying you need to redo the whole thing, those were Hail Marys that did not result in touchdowns, shall we say. Okay. Quiz time. Quiz time. Rebecca, can you pull the poll up for me? 
There you go. Thank you. I don't have it on either of my screens. I'm sorry, everything covers. In order to meet the RWA submission deadline, are signatures required? Yes or no? And again, we're getting a lot of participation and this will be good for discussion too. I won't give any more away than that. <laughs> Okay. Well, there, there's only two choices, so it's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But it's it's a it's a little neck and neck here. Ooh. Okay, we'll give everybody just another moment. Numbers are slowing down. Okay, and we'll end the poll and share the results. Well, unfortunately, you guys got this one wrong. Yeah. Signatures are not required prior to the September 8th submission deadline. So hopefully that's good news. You don't have to have it signed by then. You just have to send it in. So you have to fund it, fill out all your information and send it into GSA. And then we will route it for signatures after that date. So you might need to be on your game, top of your game, have your director or somebody ready to sign towards the end of the fiscal year, but those signatures can happen around the 20th, 25th of September, that's okay. We do not expect to see it, yeah, hopefully not that late, but uh, we do not expect to see signatures before the 8th, uh, unless you're really looking to get packages accepted right now, that's fine too, but the September 8th deadline does not need to include a signature. In fact, you can't, if you are submitting it on September 8th, you cannot uh, have a signature on there when you hit that submit button. It's impossible because GSA routes it for signature, so. Rachel, before we jump ahead, I want to hit on two things kind of related to signatures, because I think hopefully it'll explain why folks may have been confused on this one. I can't say how many of you, because we can't see you guys, and that wouldn't help. So just in your mind, be ready to understand. So internally, you very well may have signatures that are required and approvals before you are allowed, if you will, to send the RWA to GSA. What we're talking about in this question is not your internal approval. That should all happen before you send things over. You should not send something over that is not ready to be obligated. But the actual obligational signature, which is what we're talking about at the very end, that is what's not required. But many of you I do know have some internal routing you have to do before you're, you're hitting that send GSA button to make sure the funds can be committed using very financial terms. So those things likely can. Hopefully that's maybe where the mix up was and we should be more clear that we're talking about the RWA signature, um, the actual signature on the RWA form. So that was one thing I wanted to um, elaborate a little bit more on and the other one is escaping me. It was another good one and I apologize. It left my brain. We can come back. Oh, I do remember. Sorry, I apologize. I'm sorry, it's a lot. So. Another thing is toward the end of the fiscal year, we start hearing, Rachel's example made me think of this with, you could receive the signature package on September 25th. If you send something to us September 8th, let's say you've got your folks, you guys are working until you get these things across the fence to GSA, so we make their deadline and then put the ball in their court to review them and send them for signature from September 9th forward. A lot of people do that. So you may not actually see a signature package until the September 20 something timeframe. Every single customer reaches out and says, I need it yesterday. I need it September 10th. My finance group tells me I cannot make an obligation after September 12th. So you need to, as much as we appreciate deadlines that folks have, if you have an internal deadline for obligation, we encourage you to send those packages well in advance of September 8th. We cannot guarantee any date for that actual RWA coming back for signature except September 30th. If you send it to us, we are doing everything within our power if you've made the September 8th deadline to review, send, route, and receive signatures by September 30th. And that's a common issue that a lot of customers have and we completely understand and respect it. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do. 
if everybody sends them all in, it's taking time to review them. That's what we do. They're put literally in order of how they come in. So if you have internal deadlines, make sure you're thinking about that and you should make the September 8th earlier for your agency. Sorry, Rachel. Well, that's good. All right. Amendments. So now we have our RWA accepted and you encounter something for which you would like to amend the RWA. So RWA amendments are acceptable for additions within the initial fiscal year. So as long as you submitted that RWA to us in the current fiscal year uh, and you want to change the scope, you can modify the RWA to change the scope. You can reduce the scope and you can uh, give us additional money for antecedent liability. So we talked about antecedent liability before. Those are those unforeseen conditions, those cost increases without a scope increase. So if you need to change the RWA, you can do that for any of those reasons. If you need to change the RWA and you're trying to do it for one of these other reasons, you are not going to be successful. So if you want to increase the scope add new scope after the initial fiscal year of the RWA, you are out of luck. We are not going to accept that. If you have new scope that you want to execute, you are going to have to provide us a new RWA. And that is all regardless of funding type. So even if you have a know your RWA that we accepted last fiscal year in FY21, we are not going to let you add scope to that RWA this fiscal year. You can provide us a new RWA for that new scope, you can use that same fund, but we are not going to allow you to amend the existing RWA for new scope. And we talked briefly about contract options. Those are considered new scope at the time that they are exercised. So if you have a contract option that GSA has gotten pricing for where maybe you thought you'd move forward with it, maybe you weren't sure whether or not you would, that must be on a new RWA at the time that GSA exercises that option. So let's see if you got that concept. This is one that people are uh, usually confused about. GSA can always walk you through it. Can new requirements, new scope, be added to the scope of work on an RWA after the first fiscal year in which it was accepted? And we've got lots of voting happening. This group's been great with voting. Give another moment here. Okay, I think we've slowed down. Oh, guess we found another box of ballots here. Here we go. Okay. We'll end the poll and share the results. There you go. No, no is the correct answer. Once the fiscal year has lapsed, you may no longer add new scope. Regardless of fund type. All right, so how do you fund an amendment? If you're within that initial fiscal year, you're probably using that same fund that you just used on the RWA that we just accepted. So uh, not a problem. You have to use funds that are available from the fiscal year that the original RWA was submitted and accepted. So if you are in a different fiscal year than when the RWA was submitted and accepted, so say we have that, uh, got an example down there for FY19, maybe GSA accepted an RWA in FY19, that means if you are amending the RWA, the only reason you can amend it, first of all, is antecedent liability. You cannot add scope. You can only add funding because something got more expensive, like the pandemic happened. So if you need to amend that RWA in FY22, you are supposed to use FY19 funding. So you're supposed to use funds which were available in FY19, which is the year that the original RWA was submitted and accepted. That could mean FY19 annual funds. 
It could mean multiple year funds, which for which the obligational authority spans over FY19, or it could be no year funds. So no year funds are those magic unicorn funds where they are both uh, future and past uh, retroactively available. So you can amend an RWA with no year funds if you need to. If you are out of all of those options, no funding from FY19 is available, then you can use current fiscal year funding if you also sign the statement of further written assurance. So that waiver essentially says, hey, do you remember that incremental funding discussion we had before? It says, hey, I know I am incrementally funding this RWA because I'm now mixing FY19 funds and FY22 funds and that's not supposed to be allowed, but I don't have another choice. I am out of all of the funding from the year of bona fide need. I must add funding from the current fiscal year. So everything needs to stay together as one package, one unified deliverable. So it has to be amended. It has to be amended with FY22 funding. So sign that statement of further written assurance to ensure that you understand that statement. And when I say you, that should be the fund certifying official. So the same person who's signing the RWA would be the one signing the statement of further written assurance. For judiciary specifically, they have requested that only the AO can sign that waiver. So uh, just keep that in mind if you are a judiciary employee you are not allowed to sign that locally. You have to bump that up to the AO. Project closeout. Hopefully everything went successfully during the execution phase. GSA spent the money that we needed to, got you your product. And once that product or uh, service or space is ready for beneficial use, meaning that it can be used for the original purpose as intended, then we will issue substantial completion. So that means that the work is substantially complete. The bulk of the work is complete. So at that point, we may not have all the little nicks and scratches painted, and uh, maybe there's a few things that are aesthetic. Those are going to be on a punch list. So GSA develops a punch list of items which have yet to be completed after we have declared substantial completion. At this point, contractors have not been fully paid. We still need that money. So we, when we send you a letter that says the work is substantially complete, it specifically instructs you not to take any of your money back. Do not deobligate your funding. We're still working on things. Once we have paid all of our contractors and we have invoiced you, our customer, for all of those bills to GSA, then we will issue a completion letter. So that, com or sorry, a closeout letter. Uh, the closeout letter will indicate that everything is 100% done and you can now take any remaining funding back. So Rachel, does that mean if there's remaining funds, I can ask GSA to do something else with that extra money? No, if there is anytime the word excess funding or residual funding or leftover funding or remaining funding, anything like that uh, pops up, huge red flag. That is a violation of the bona fide needs rule because you did not declare that as a need within the fiscal year that the funding came from. You are not allowed to use that fund for a new purpose. And then of course, further limited by GSA's limitation for no new scope on prior fiscal year RWA. So even if it is a no year fund, we are going to send that back to you. At that point, if you would like to use that fund for something else, you may put it on a new RWA. You can spend it on another project which may be encountered antecedent liability, unforeseen conditions. Perhaps you need that prior year funding to cover those overages, but you may not leave it on the RWA to use for new, year, new work. GSA cannot hold on to it and find another purpose for it. GSA can't transfer money between different RWAs. We must give it back to you. And we realize that not all customers have uh, localized funding that some, when we send funding back, it goes to a centralized source like the AO with judiciary. Unfortunately, we, we don't really 
we can't do anything about that. So uh, we have to send the money back. And at that point is between you and your central group who now holds the purse strings to figure out what you can use that for. Thanks, Rachel. And I, I do see one question that I'm going to just answer live real quick. Can substantial completion occur before the punch list? They are simultaneous. So the punch list is created in order to issue substantial completion. All right. So we are coming up toward the end of the slide deck, which is good because there's only 10 minutes left, huh? Whew, flying through. So as we mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff that governs the RWA program, the process, the people, the project management side. It's tough sometimes to know where to go. So we have lots of websites and lots of references and links. And we've tried to capture as many of them as we can here. It's a great, useful kind of little, you get the slides, maybe keep it as a quick reference. So the best one I can tell you are the first two links you see on there. Or if you're interested in it, or heck, you just have a question, there is a multitude of information um, available on gsa.gov slash ereta. The next one is the gsa.gov slash rwa. These are both external sites. You can get them from any computer. You don't need to be within firewalls or anything else. You shouldn't have a problem. Um, heck, your kids can pull them up from their, home, their school computers probably. Like there's great information that should be easy to get to. But some of the where to go in terms of the people, the RWA policy and program questions. So if you have questions about some of the things Rachel and I spoke about today specifically, the best resources that we can encourage you to talk to would be your RWA manager, which they're linked there. Actually, we have one of them on the call is helping answer some questions today for you in the chat pane. There are resource people. They know what's happening specifically in your regions. They can help you with if you're having a non-responsive PM or if you don't understand something that's being communicated to you because you learned during this training X and now you're being told Y. There's obviously an explanation that needs to happen and they're awesome at being able to explain that stuff. So definitely lean on them. Ask RWA is another great resource. It's an, a group email box that comes to central office. It is not for a project specific question. If you have a question about the status of a project, the central office team is probably not gonna have the information, right? That would be a regional thing. But if you have an overarching question, something you don't understand, can't get a hold of folks, need help, another great resource. I'm not gonna walk through all of them on there, but those are two very important ones based on everything we taught you. The rest that are in there, you can see kind of who they are. You'll see, uh, um, natural progression of start locally with your regional contacts, move nationally if that's the thing. All the way down at the bottom where you see everything pretty much from FPDS all the way down. We put lots of acronyms on here you might not know. Um, FPDS is the Federal Procurement Doc Digital System. I don't know what the D is. I apologize. Data. It is on the RWA form, so I should know. I'm sorry for that. But if you have questions, We've got the person to talk to you. It's not any of the other people you see there. Billing questions, that's something that isn't necessarily, it's gonna be a different group of people. So we have the email boxes that you should reach out to. If they're non-responsive or you don't get the information you need, come back up to the top, let people know, forward those emails and we'll help you out. And then a really cool one that we've recently, Rachel stumbled upon during one of the trainings she was doing before, is the vendor and customer self-service access issues for password resets. That is one of the most common questions I think we receive that we go, I'm not sure, because it's not our system. We actually found the email address of who you can email to, to get that information. So that's awesome. So lots of great information and links here when you have the slide deck, I encourage you to look at them. And of course you can email us um, anytime and we'll be sure to help chat through. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Rebecca to What's coming? Thanks so much, Ashley and Rachel. Um, and we'd actually like to ask one more question. So I'm gonna throw a poll up there for everybody. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, this just helps us make sure that we are staying on track. Um, and this has to do with how you feel after taking this class. If you all wouldn't mind just sharing with us if this has helped you get more comfortable 
uh, a lot more comfortable, a little more comfortable. If a little more training would help, that'll help us with our planning efforts going forward. And we sure appreciate this. Thank you. And after everyone has a moment to give us a little feedback, then we'll close out here with a, a strong end of summer presentation series. Okay, thanks. I'll share the results. Looks pretty evenly spaced between folks who feel somewhat more comfortable and much more comfortable. And uh, that 19% of you who'd like to have more training, don't worry, it's coming, <laughs> okay? So thank you for that. And again, I want to thank our outstanding presenters. You thought I was making that up when I said that earlier, didn't you? Uh, Ashley and Rachel absolutely know their stuff. Thank you so much. And also, we want to thank all of you, our clients who are able to join us for today's session. Uh, and also, thank you for all your questions. We've collected those, and we will be uh, posting formal written responses as a frequently asked questions document for future reference. And we'll be putting that on our website, the www.gsa.gov slash CES site. And check out this list. Look at this, how we're ending the fiscal year for everybody. Uh, please join us for our next offering, which is gonna be Wednesday, July 27th, Workplace Feasibility Scenarios Made Easy with WIFM 2.0. Uh, in that session, we'll be taking a look at the latest version of this incredible feasibility modeling tool. A couple weeks after that, on Tuesday, August 16th, you can attend our eReta Digest session, which we offer quarterly, and uh, that gives you a comprehensive look at all things eReta, which, as mentioned, is the electronic system for submitting work requests and digitally signed reimbursable, reimbursable work authorizations to GSA. A couple days after that, on Thursday, August 18th, you can learn all about Kahua uh, at Say Aloha to Kahua. Maybe you've heard of Kahua. It is a new web-based project management and collaboration software that PBS is adopting and is used widely in the private sector, which allows customers, contractors, and GSA to securely collaborate throughout a project's lifecycle. Then in September, if anyone has time at the end of fiscal year, we'll finish it out with two other offerings that we trust will be very beneficial. First, if you're involved in occupancy agreements, you'll definitely want to attend policy and process changes to occupancy agreements, the OASIS overview on Thursday, September 8th. If you attended the April 5th session, this is an encore presentation. And second, if you're involved in planning, developing, budgeting, or executing lease projects or reimbursable projects, do join us on Thursday, September 15th for the Kahua Club, where we'll take, you, uh, at a a, take a closer look at all that that tool can provide you. All of these sessions will be recorded and we'll post them on our YouTube channel. So you can click on those links there uh, in the slide to access any of the recordings that we already have posted. And you can register for any of the sessions there on the registration list. And again, to learn about any sessions and to register, please visit www.gsa.gov CES. The goal of the Client Enrichment Series is to engage you, our audience, in workplace topics that contribute to your mission's success and your effective management of your real estate and workplace programs. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day with a minute to spare. <laughs>